Uh, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much all for being here on time. We've got a packed agenda. Territorial development in Europe in the digital age is the theme of this morning's session. And uh, just to prove that we also do low-tech voting, I'm going to give you a quick question and ask you for three answers. So um, are you either one, a digital native, somebody who's grown up digital, are you a digital migrant, somebody who's transitioned to digitalization as part of their life? Or are you, like me, a digital dinosaur, somebody who hasn't yet really embraced digitalization? So hands up the digital natives, please. OK. Most of them are under 35, but some of them are not. Hands up the digital migrants, people who become welcome to our world. Thank you very much. And the digital dinosaurs, yes, well. I'll see you in the bar later, okay? We'll, we'll have a bit of a chat later on. We look forward to that. Um, we're, we're going to have two fantastic keynote speakers. We're going to have a panel of four people. At the end of this session, we're going to have a family photo as well. So don't forget to make sure you look right at about 11 a.m. We'll be going out to the stairs to do that. Um, but before we get to that, um, let me just say that we're going to pick up, obviously, on the themes of the two opening remarks. So we're looking at the future of the EU in the digital age. We're going to try to understand how digitalization not just changes processes of economy or public services or social networking, but we're trying to try to explore the theme that Ilona was opening up. Does digitalization have the potential, the promise, to change spatial and territorial development patterns in Europe? The really key question of today. Or will digitalization somehow reinforce existing spatial and territorial development patterns? This is going to be the big question in the room, if you like. And we'll be trying to explore how digitalization might change those patterns through which processes, economic, social, environmental, public services, leadership, uh, civic engagement, but we'll also be thinking about how it might accidentally reinforce existing patterns. And you can imagine, therefore, a series of very big implications for policy that will come from that. So just before I introduce our two fantastic speakers, let's go back to Slido, if we may. We're going to open two votes. One of them is going to be a vote where I'll ask you to vote now, and we'll look at the answer immediately. And then the second one is a vote I'm going to ask you to continue throughout the morning by punching in as many times as you like individual words that occur to you as being relevant to the subject at hand. But first, let's go to um, our first question, if we may. So this is uh, the next question in the, in the Slido pack. Can we see it, please? Yes, we've done that. OK, so are you optimistic about Europe's readiness for digital transition? It's a very broad question. You might be very optimistic, somewhat optimistic, or not at all optimistic. Please vote now. Now, Laurent was masterful in making sure 100 people voted, but I'm sure he bribed a few of you to get there. Um, we got 91. We would like 100 if that's possible. So those of you who are texting your lovers, please focus on the voting. Be better. There we are with 100. Can we see the results, please? OK, so vast majority of you are somewhat optimistic, and only 6% not at all optimistic. So we must ask the sober question, is this optimism well-founded? OK, and we'll try to get to that in the conversation. Um, let's go to our next question, please. Thank you. Now, name the three key areas where digital transition will have the biggest effect, in your opinion, in the coming years. Now, this is not multiple choice. You can write here any words you like. And when you see other people writing words that you think, ha-ha, that's a good word, you can endorse it or like it or favorite it with the thumbs up which means that over the course of the morning, we'll be building a word map that is the answer to this question. You don't have to vote now, but if you'd like to vote now, please do. So we want you to put in words here. So the three key areas, could it be public services? Might it be entrepreneurship? Could it be territorial change? Might it be um, you know, addressing uh, the, the needs of people in isolated areas? Might it be something else? Yeah. 
and we want you to put in the words that you like and then we want you to like the other the words that you see that you think are good and we'll keep this going and I will ask us uh, to have a look at it various times during the session as it goes along and then lastly I want to say as Laurent suggested that during the course of the morning while our keynote speakers are speaking while our panelists are giving their reflections if you want to start putting questions into Slido and then you want to start favoriting or liking or endorsing the questions that others have asked, when we get to the Q&A session, we will then know exactly which questions have been ranked by whom. And this is a fantastic way also to use the people who are not here in the room but are following our debates today uh, via the live streaming that's going on. So that's also a way for them to participate. So I hope all of that's clear. Is it clear? Yeah? You're going to be ready for the photo at 11 a.m.? Yeah? Good. Okay, let's go to our first keynote speaker of this morning. Now, many of you know Dr. Paul Timmers, International Advisor for Digital Policy and Economy, and many of you will know him as the former Director of Digital Society, Trust and Cybersecurity at the European Commission. It's a great pleasure to have Paul with us here today. As, as you know, he's both a scholar and an entrepreneur, a civic leader uh, in his own right. He's going to pick up the theme of shaping the future of the EU in the digital age. Paul, welcome to Tallinn. The floor is yours. And I must say, Greg, um, if you are uh, a digital dinosaur, you are very dynamic and engaging. So <laughs> that's a good way. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here today uh, on stage and uh, present to you something about the future, the digital future of Europe. Um, and let me start first of all by uh, thanking and congratulating the Estonian presidency of the EU because they have been really a digital presidency and have been really putting this on the agenda. And I can indeed recommend to follow what they say. I myself am an e-resident and I'm going to set up a company here in Estonia using uh, the e-residency scheme. Um, I also would like to uh, congratulate Finland today with its uh, 100 years of independence. Very important that we all have our identity. <laughs> and certainly thanking Espon for uh, inviting me, giving the opportunity to talk to you. I will quickly take you through a number of elements about the state of um, digital in the European Union. First of all, uh, digital is everywhere. It's uh, from your pocket to the plane, it's from the couch to the supermarket. I don't need to say that. And digital is big, big business. It's also big policy. It's uh, Merkel, Macron and others talking about it at major forums. It is um, the kind of thing where we actually have to recognize it's not Europe that is leading really in this. It's rather the US, it's uh, China, it's what they call GAFA the Google, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Apples of this world. And we are increasingly seeing digital in all policies. And that's actually, I think, really a theme for the future, having digital in all policies and how you do that. So uh, let's talk about some of the big trends. And I'm referring here to people that are major thinkers or analysts in the world of uh, digital and in the world of technology. One of those is Mary Meeker. Worth well to read it uh, up. She's got a 300 slide uh, pack about the next two years. So it's just about the next two years. And one of the trends that she sees is how much more time people are spending online. Up to six hours a day spending online. And look at that right side. You see that half of that time is actually spent on the mobile. So the mobile is a real important thing, which you of course know, but you also need to make use of it. That's obviously the message from her side. And just one other element that she has is about the explosive growth of data. That's in all sectors of the economy, but here an important example about healthcare. So healthcare data is growing at 50% a year. 50% a year is massive amounts of data. Many more doctors are using electronic health records. Your health data can be collected from actually your, that same mobile phone or fitness device as I have here, and that's a very rich asset. Something else that has already been mentioned here, Broadband everywhere, but not really everywhere. Not so much yet in the rural areas, and that's a real risk. That's where we have policy for. Let me call it something else. Over the past year, there has been a uh, wide debate in Europe, running until the summer roughly, 
uh, organized by Atomium, a think tank, uh, next generation internet debate. And in that one, they had a, um, they involved large newspapers like uh, Le Monde, uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine, Guardian, uh, and they also had an online uh, exercise with about 500,000 comments, which they actually analyzed with sentiment software. And they asked people, what do you think are the big technologies that will make profound change in the years to come, in the way we learn, we work, we do commerce, etc., we govern. And number one, big data and AI, AI, artificial intelligence, digital manufacturing and online platforms, IoT, Internet of Things, so just remember the abbreviation, IoT, uh, open source, blockchain, and you will not be surprised if you have just followed what happens around blockchain in the skyrocketing uh, uh, pricing in the stock markets, and a number of other technologies. So this is what people expect as the big technologies. And indeed, these kind of technologies are also coming back when you ask, for example, the World Economic Forum, when they talk about what's going to change in cities. Yes, they do talk about Internet of Things and about mobile technologies. They talk about big data. They talk also about this EID, like the e-resident that I uh, have in my pocket. They talk about data analytics. And the areas that they see changing in cities are around all of these city functions, like uh, power, electricity, transport, public services, health, and what have you, in the areas of outsourcing these services in integrated city services, end-to-end -end transport, which is a real struggle in many cities. I invite you to come to Brussels and try to do smooth end-to-end -end transport, and probably London, you might say the same about that. Sharing and circular economy, a thing that's very much in the picture and interesting that they allocate that to cities, and city advisory services. So they are seeing the same technologies interacting in a transformative way in cities. So what are then the big expectations? Well, let me first mention one big expectation. If you just look a little bit further, um, 25 years ahead, uh, in, 19, in, in 2043, Ray Kurzweil, who's one of the thinkers about uh, how technology is impacting all of us very much and is saying this is an, an exponential development, he's saying in uh, 2043, so just 25 years from now, and I think all of us will still be there then, um, you can buy for the price of a computer today the capacity of a million human brains. And you may not say in, take it seriously, but many of his predictions actually have, have come true. So one of the big expectations is that it actually will go ever faster. And indeed, the rate of major change is doubling every 20 years. So in the last 20 years, we had three big changes. That is social media, if you look back, uh, the mobile phone, and uh, the internet. So in the next 20, 25 years, until Ray Kurzweil prediction can be tested, uh, we will have six big changes. And what does that actually mean? Because these changes are really big, you know, it really makes a difference. Social media, you are just using here, Slido, uh, the mobile phone, uh, the internet, just to mention, obviously. Big changes that have happened to us, there will be six of those in the next 25 years. Uh, let's just uh, think about it. What would that mean for the digital transformation and territorial thinking? It certainly means that you cannot sit on your hands, as they say in Belgium. You have to act. Now, let's just take a few of those uh, big expectations. What might happen? Well, one of that is we might all become much smarter and more productive with artificial intelligence, because we'll have that as a tool in our hands. We will get much more abo abundance, we will become richer, as a matter of fact, with this richness of data and Internet of Things, all the devices, Internet of Things is all these devices that can be connected everywhere, that are collecting data from your mobile phone to a sensor about temperature or electricity consumption or, or um, air quality. And we will live longer and healthier. Let's look at that. Well, indeed, smarter with artificial intelligence. If you follow the press, you know that Facebook is uh, now using artificial intelligence software to predict when people are inclined to commit suicide. So actually, artificial intelligence is very accurate in predicting this kind of uh, potential behavior. Artificial intelligence doesn't need to be huge and big. If you have just 205 neurons, these kind of things are working with artificial neurons, this artificial intelligence, you can very accurately predict um, uh, and recognize a face. And face recognition is going to be everywhere if it isn't already happening right now. Smart cars is very much in the picture, self-driving cars. And actually people are saying the combination between robotics, so that's smart kind of mechanics, you might say, and uh, electric cars is, uh, is, is made in heaven. 
but you can also use artificial intelligence for the social good. Uh, for, uh, IBM has uh, launched a challenge to use artificial intelligence, deep science and cloud, cloud computing, you know, that's where you store all this data and where you can do the computing, uh, to use it for societal challenges like climate, like migration, like health, like food. So we will become smarter with artificial intelligence. We can also benefit a lot from this abundance of Internet of Things, of these devices that are everywhere that can collect data, and data itself. Uh, I, for example, have become a user of a smart meter, a little plug smart meter at home, and I discovered that I was using uh, a tremendous amount of electricity due to one device that actually I could replace. Uh, it was a, was a, a fridge. Uh, and you can, this kind of stuff, it's already, already actually a bit old-fashioned. You can just buy it today and use it. That's an Internet of Things, and you can use it to your own benefit. Um, you can monitor what is happening in your bed. Well, not uh, everything that is happening in your bed, but whether your bed is very healthy, the bed bugs, they can be tracked with an Internet of Things, and the data can be analyzed. And the big thing about Internet of Things and data is expected to be happening in industry. It's called Industry 4.0. It's the transformation, so you make all of the manufacturing intelligent, and you can really start doing tuned manufacturing. And it's a big transformation that's happening right now. A lot of money in that. As a matter of fact, you can see that manufacturing, this is not so easily readable, but that manufacturing is one of the biggest uh, revenue generators already in Internet of Things, but all of these areas are growing at 10, 12, 15, 20% a year, from manufacturing to healthcare when you talk about Internet of Things. And a lot of good coming out of that. One of the good things that might be coming out of that is that we are going to live longer and healthier. Um, so I, for example, on my mobile phone, I have this app uh, called Babylon, with whom I can talk to a doctor. Actually, it's an artificial doctor. I can tell what I, are my symptoms, it's giving, giving advice, and the moment that it cannot go further, it will connect me to a real doctor or to a device that can monitor my, uh, my, my vital signs. And so that's artificial intelligence used to make me healthier. We have very advanced stuff like, you know, picking up your brain signals. This is a very charming story about a young guy in Italy who was paralyzed from his neck downwards couldn't participate anymore, got this kind of uh, brain signal device that picked up what he thought, and with this, his uh, thinking, he can actually steer his wheelchair. So his mother said, I'm so happy he's independent again, he can participate again, thanks really to this way of uh, controlling his own mobility. And controlling mobility, we will have many, many elderly people. In some way or another, we need to address this. They cannot all be in a care home. People will have to continue living independently at home. And that includes mobility like smart walkers. And some people are even saying death is obsolete. Well, perhaps it's true. We'll see. So, living longer and healthier, becoming richer thanks to data and Internet of Things, uh, becoming all smarter and more productive with artificial intelligence, that's our future ahead. Well, I don't think that story is quite the story that's going to happen. It's a happy story, but it's not going to become true. Why not? Because there are many downsides. So there's a dark side. So if you ask in this big survey that was done over the past year, people in Europe, what do you think are the downsides or the dark sides of uh, all these technological developments? Number one, they mention security. So cybersecurity, hacking, those kind of things. We don't feel secure and safe anymore in this digital world, is what they are saying. Or staying in control. Is it the machine that is taking over, rather than us taking still the decisions? Is it that self-driving car that does everything and we are out of control? Or are we not empowered anymore? Are we becoming the slaves of the machine? We will have to follow the machine rather than the machine following us. And what about employment and inequality? Who will still benefit from that and where are the jobs going to go? and other concerns around the proper legal framework and actually what they call the stupidity of AI. I recommend that you look up this uh, study because there's a lot of rich information about the expectations and the concerns. So the dark side of one of those could actually be around jobs. So will digitization and going on the internet uh, deliver meaningful work for everybody and generate salaries that are at least equal or better than the current uh, levels of salaries? And again, asking that same large group of people, there were thousands of responses, over 50% says, no, it will not contribute. And others are more positive, but 50% at least is concerned about this digital future in terms of uh, the quality and the level of uh, work. And indeed, McKinsey says, 
under most scenarios, so they talk about work and jobs, the transitions will be very challenging. It will match or even exceed the scale of the shifts out of agriculture and manufacturing that we have seen in the past. Think about that. This was an agricultural society 100 years ago. There is now 5% agriculture in most areas in Europe. I think it's around that, 5%, 3%. That's an enormous shift. Imagine that this happens to jobs. And indeed, there are millions and millions of jobs that are predicted to be affected. And then something else about a, uh, AI and Internet of Things and data and longevity. Uh, are there going to be haves and have-nots, those that are in and out? What people are thinking, again, when you ask them across Europe, they are saying the ones that will benefit most from that are young citizens and uh, the big tech companies and the startup companies, and the ones that will be benefiting least are the older citizens. Uh, it's the public sector. Uh, it's uh, uh, public organizations. So there's a concern there, for sure. And uh, what will that actually do to our retirement plans? So yes, there are upsides and downsides, and we will have to balance that. And that's what policy and that's what this seminar is also about. That's the thinking, that's the shaping that you will do. And so there are some very difficult questions in this, in this digital policy that we will have to tackle in policy uh, development. For example, who owns the data? The data that is going from my device, my, I've got a Fitbit here, is it owned by me or Fitbit? It's personal data, but what is Fitbit doing with it? What is it when they get more value out of it because they analyze my Fitbit with all your Fitbits and then uh, create a new service? Is that my value or is that their value? Uh, can they give my information to someone else? What about the free flow of data across borders, but also uh, in the industry? Can everybody use data for uh, the greater good? What about digital sovereignty? Are we going to become completely dependent upon others in the world, and don't we have our autonomy anymore? And what about the 100 years of independence of Finland? What about democratizing and humanizing uh, AI, uh, making AI artificial intelligence accountable so that we actually understand what the algorithms do and we can say, yes, I agree with that decision or I do not agree with that decision. And what about the good and the bad and the ugly of the sharing economy? Not everything is rosy in the sharing economy and there are great concerns about what some of, for example, the rental schemes are doing to the quality of, uh, of uh, cities. So there are difficult policy questions. Let me then finish. I think in these policy questions, there are a number of policies that you may want to look at specifically. They are in evolution, but you can make, them, make use of them when you look at this whole spectrum of the expectation of technology. Plugging the broadband gap, that's obvious. We need to have broadband and capable broadband everywhere, and there's European policy under discussion right now for that, the Electronic Communications Code. And then data, I would focus especially on that. If as a city, as a region, as a territory, you're not yet digitizing your data, your, your, your data, you are missing a tremendous asset and someone else will do it for you. So digitize the data that you have in the cities, that you have in the region, whether it's about tourism, mobility, health, the people living there, whatever you can do. Make sure it's digital and that it is under control of the citizens. And that's where we have policy, the free flow of data policy and the general data protection regulation about data protection. E-services, digital service roads, uh, and actually the, the electronic identity card as part of that, too, so that you can deliver services across regions, uh, inside and across regions. Services for transport, mobility, uh, for energy, for health, for uh, taxation, what have you. Certainly, pay a lot of attention to cybersecurity. All of your efforts may be in vain when your information is stolen or uh, when you get hacked. Put digital to work in the urban and regional agendas that are there in Europe for you to use and for you to further develop. And we'll hear more about that. And go digital in all sectors. There are no sectors excluded. All sectors are going digital. All sectors will have to amend their policy. And this is about e-government. This is about transport. It's about energy. It's about health. It's about the environment all of these sectors. And that's where you can do a lot of good and a lot of bad with digital. And then shape your own future, participating in the research programs, in the territorial development programs, setting up and uh, 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 developing the territorial governments. So a whole richness of policies. My wish would be that this is happening by you in a human-centered way in digital transformation in the territorial thinking. Thank you very much. Paul, thank you very much indeed. And you brilliantly came in on exactly 15 minutes. And colleagues, I didn't tell you at the beginning, but we're operating a musical guillotine today, which means that 
any speaker who speaks beyond the allotted time, music will start to play just as they go over it. Paul perfectly timed his, but all other speakers, beware. The musical guillotine is there. Uh, Paul, you told us many important things, particularly you focused on the exponential nature of these new technologies, and you spoke about the high expectations. You said three things. We might be smarter and more productive. We might be able to uh, work much better with IoT and big data, and we might live longer and be healthier. But then you said, yes, indeed, digitalization can help in these ways, but don't forget the three big downsides, security, data governance, cybersecurity, legal frameworks, jobs, the loss of jobs in the economy that may be possible because of this, and then the digital divide, the haves, the have-nots, the sharing economy, issues to do with aging. You gave us seven rather brilliant uh, propositions about which policies are going to be important. I won't repeat all of them because you said them very cleverly, but you particularly focused on the interaction between digitalization, governance, space, lifestyle, and uh, your final message was shape your own future. So just to check how many of you were listening, let's ask you some quick questions. How many of you have already consulted the online doctor? If you have, please raise your hands. Okay. How many of you would like to consult the online doctor? Let's see. Okay. How many of you will never consult the online doctor? Okay. Very good. Okay. How many of you are spending more than six hours a, a day online? This was Paul's first point. If you are, raise your hands. Okay. If you're not, raise your hands. If you don't know how to do that, raise your hands. Okay. Right. Uh, it's only me, it seems. This is a bit of a problem. And then how many of you want some kind of digital thing that monitors all of the activity in your bed? Do you want it? <laughs> if you do, raise your hands. No? Okay, well, so, Paul, you suggested it, but nobody seems to want it. So I don't think you're going to win the Dragon's Den with this application, but very interesting. Fantastic. And Paul will be joining the panel later on, so we'll have a chance to talk a lot more with him. Now, let's go back to our friend Laurent, who is the Deputy Director of the ESPON program. And Laurent is going to talk to us in particular about the territorial and urban dimensions in digitalization of public services. So, Head of Unit for Evidence and Outreach at ESPON EGTC, please welcome back Laurent Friderez. <laughs> Seems like you're getting lucky. I'm getting lucky? Yes, that was the song that introduced you there. So, very good. But yeah. the, the clock, the clock, now the clock has started. OK, so th 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 there we go. So uh, good morning again. Um, digital tools and, and solutions are transforming uh, public services and the way uh, government, governments uh, s serve the needs of their, their citizens. And uh, some cities have already started adopting new solutions and transforming their, their processes, but there are still many challenges ahead. There's a large hole outside, on the pavement outside my house. Um, I've been walking past this for quite a while, and um, a few weeks ago, I decided to take action. So uh, my city, like so many cities, has, is going digital, so they now have an app. Um, this app allows you to track buses, uh, to track parking spaces, to see uh, what, what events are on. And it also has a particular feature that allows you to report particular incidents or issues in the infrastructure. Um, it was two weeks before the local election, so I thought, you know, why not? Let's try my luck. So I took a picture of my pavement. Um, there it is. And I submitted it via the app. Um, so what the app does it essentially logs all these incidents that are reported by citizens. So my little picture uh, with a short note just to say, I, th I think the, the photo was quite self-explanatory, but to say, you know, the pavement is broken. Um, so, so up it went into the app, and it was mapped along with a series of other incidents here, here on, the map, on, on the map that you can see. So a couple of days later, very exciting. So the status changed, and my little photo was uh, assigned an incident number. I think if something is assigned an incident number, it makes it quite serious. So uh, the status of this issue was, was confirmed. So you see a little orange thing there. Um, and then not much happened. Um, the elections came and went. You know, my pavement was still broken. But then last week, what happened? Something changed. 
we had a little green box that appeared. Uh, it wasn't actually terminated in, in French, it means completed. So my little incident was completed. Uh, I was a bit confused because my pavement was still broken. So what had, hap what had happened? Um, there was a little note attached that said, well, so your little incident was passed on to the service for infrastructure and has been assigned to the program for uh, being fixed. So hopefully my pavement, when I get home at the end of the week, will be fixed. So what does this little example uh, tell us? Um, the way cities engage with their, cit with their citizens is really changing. So uh, the engagement, um, th this particular example allowed me to engage very directly with my, my local administration. Um, it creates uh, transparency, so I, I, I created this incident report um, and, and I was able to track, uh, to track, the, to track the progress. Um, it also has a fundamental impact uh, for the administrations themselves because they have to change their processes, they have to change the way in which services work with one another. Um, so in this case, the, the service that runs the website, of course, has to communicate with the services that, that runs the, the road infrastructure. Um, it also raises issues of trust. In this particular instance, um, I submitted this report anonymously um, because all this data is available, so, and I wasn't quite sure what they were going to do with it, um, so they might send me the invoice at the end. So I figured let's do it anonymously. So there's certainly issues of trust and, and, and data security uh, that need to be addressed. The digital transition is really reshaping public services. We, we've heard some of the, the key messages um, already from our policy brief by Predu in the introduction. Uh, the vast majority of city services have in, improved as a result of, of digitalization. Um, the policy brief um, that S1 has pre prepared, and you can find a copy outside, um, we surveyed over 130 cities in Europe and asked the chief digital officers, what is the status of the digital transformation of their city services? And the results is essentially what you see inside the policy brief. So more than one in three cities has seen a substantial increase in the uptake of specific services as a result of digitalization. Uh, over two thirds of cities also use the, the data that they gathered from these new digital services to improve decision making processes. Um, costs have been reducing. Uh, but then, of course, also there is the challenge of, of, uh, um, of jobs. So uh, also three in five cities has seen a reduction in, in staffing, although for most uh, this was a marginal uh, reduction. So Aspon being Aspon, of course, we try to map this particular uh, transition. So we looked at different types of services. So for nine different service themes, from spatial planning to education and and, and healthcare, we looked at the level at which the digital, the digital solutions are being implemented. So is this at local level, at regional level, or at national level? And there are some differences. So you can see here that uh, for spatial planning and construction, uh, it's primarily at the local level that services have been digitalized, whereas for, for healthcare and, and road infrastructure, um, it's really at the national level where uh, the transition is taking shape. So we try to map all this. Um, you're very familiar, most of you are assume with Aspon maps, but we try to come up with a little bit of an innovative format. So inside the policy brief, you find a map that looks a little bit like this. And what it shows you is the share of service digitalization. So little boxes that are in red um, have a low uh, level of digitalization and, and in blue, um, a high um, share of digitalization. Um, and we mapped this, so for different regions in Europe, so you can compare Northern Europe to Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and Southern Europe, um, and for the specific, so nine different service themes and 57 specific services, we, we, fig we, we mapped essentially what the share of digitalization is for specific services. So you can compare the level of digitalization for towns for particular services to the national level, if I take a particular example here, so for Northern Europe, obtaining land use and cadastral data online, so if you go from the left to right, you see that uh, towns have a very low level of digitalization. Uh, that's the first box. Uh, the third box is uh, larger cities, so there the, the level of digitalization is very high. Um, at the regional level, it's quite low, and at the national level, it's also quite, quite high. So what are the drivers of this uh, digital transition of, of public services? Um, clearly, it is about uh, modernizing the city services. It's about increasing efficiency. Um, it's also about improving the citizen experience, as, as we've seen in the, in the first uh, example. Um, there are some differences between towns, smaller cities, and larger cities. 
Um, for example, the towns and, and medium and small sized uh, cities have a, a higher share where the, the drivers are, are the modernization of the city services. Perhaps surprisingly, um, extending the range of services or the coverage uh, are not amongst the top, uh, the top three drivers in this instance. So how do we go about uh, bringing about this digital transition? Strategy is really key. Um, so we asked uh, the cities uh, whether they have a digital strategy in place. And, and here we can see that uh, there's still quite a lot to be done. So in, uh, in gray are the cities that have, um, that have not yet adopted a digital strategy, uh, and in dark purple you see the ones that have, have implemented. So the level of implementation of digital strategies is still uh, quite low. And, and generally, smaller towns uh, and cities are lagging behind, behind in terms of the adoption of the digital strategy, uh, but also, in, of course, in the, in the implementation. So what about the challenges uh, for implementing the, the digital transition? Perhaps not surprisingly, uh, funding is the number one uh, challenge, and this applies to, to any city independent of, of size. Um, but there are also other challenges where there are some differences between cities of different sizes. So, for example, the smaller uh, cities and towns, uh, they face a bigger challenge in terms of ha lacking an overall strategy, in terms of still having a resistance uh, to, uh, to adopt uh, digital solutions. Um, skills are quite a significant um, challenge for cities of all sizes. Um, then larger cities have uh, a higher share of them consider security concerns and, and also the particular legal framework to be barriers. Uh, that may also be a, a fact, uh, the reason for that may also be that they have perhaps progressed further in the adoption of digital solutions, so they have already adopted their, their strategy, so they've now moved on to, uh, to, to other barriers. Uh, but clearly security and, and uh, having the right legal frameworks are, are key. The way to deliver this digital uh, did new digital solutions um, clearly involves collaboration. So these are um, engaging uh, with other peers, with other cities uh, in Europe in, in understanding uh, which services they have digitalized, what are some of the best practices, but then also developing uh, partnerships, collaborations uh, with, the, with the private sector. So also the solution providers who end up delivering uh, some, of, some of these uh, solutions. And, and what's, what's come out from the, from the study is that uh, the uh, the level of engagement in these uh, collaboration networks in partnerships have a, has a direct impact on uh, the improvement to, to city digital services. And towns and smaller cities are really lagging behind in terms of uh, developing their collaborations and in terms of uh, engaging in these public-private partnerships. So there's really more to be done in, in that area. So what is the impact? Um, it's been mentioned already before, but in terms of improvement to city services, I think the evidence here is overwhelming that uh, City services has, have improved as a result of digitalization. It's a slightly sh smaller share for, for towns, but, but it's, still, it's still very significant. And in terms of the uptake uh, of services, so this is essentially cities delivering a new service um, in a digital way, um, seeing an increase in the uptake of that particular service here, um, essentially universally for, for larger cities that they have seen a, a an, up, an, an increase in the uptake of services. Uh, towns and, and smaller and medium-sized cities are lagging a little bit uh, behind also in, in this particular area. So what are some of the key policy messages that have uh, come out of this, of this research? I think what we try to do is to really tailor these messages to uh, the different levels because the message is not that every city of Every, of each, independent of their size, uh, should digitalize all its services. That is really not the point. That's also not the point of, of the mapping. Um, but I think the mapping will really give it gives us a, a detailed picture of what the status is, and I think it, it will kind of feed the debate also on how where do we go from from here. So at at EU level, I think a key is really to remove barriers to interoperability. Um, I think this is really to drive the the adoption of, of new digital services. Um, I think creating a European platform for cities to share their data and services will also allow for a wider range of services to, to be delivered. And then we need supportive legal frameworks for digital solutions um, in many areas, but particularly in healthcare and social welfare services where privacy and security are, are major concerns. 
Um, and, and there really more action is needed at, uh, at, at EU level. There's a number of initiatives that are of course ongoing, um, but, but that is one of the key, the key areas for action at the uh, EU level. So at national and regional level, I think it's key to build partnerships to develop uh, digital solutions in different sectors, but particularly in education and transport, where we see that uh, digital transformation is primarily driven by the national and regional levels. Uh, also, we've seen towns and smaller cities are lagging uh, behind, so I think it's essential to support the digital transition of towns and smaller cities. So they are, not every small town is able to, to digitalize its services, so it's key to also provide the necessary support to ensure that uh, that no town or city is left behind. Medium-sized and larger cities should invest in, in ICT infrastructure for local digital services. So uh, even if you talk about the cloud, I think there's still an infrastructure behind it, both in terms of uh, data storage, but also in terms of the communication networks, in terms of the, the fast uh, mobile, mobile internet. So the next generation IT infrastructure is absolutely essential uh, to facilitate uh, the digital uh, transition of public, public services. Um, then also, new solutions have to be tested, have to be piloted, so I think there's really an opportunity for uh, medium-sized and larger cities to open up uh, for the development, testing, and rollout of these new uh, types of solutions. So they could be new mobility solutions, they could be new uh, solutions in, uh, in, in, in planning as well. So there's really an opportunity to, to build these public-private partnerships that allow um, the demonstration, the large-scale demonstration, and the piloting of new digital solutions. Then finally, for towns and, and smaller cities, um, some are still lagging behind in adopting a digital strategy, so it's absolutely key that, uh, that, that cities do uh, put this on their agenda and adopt a digital strategy. Uh, this, the key to the su success of the implementation of the strategy is the appointment of a, di of a digital leader. So typically, digital transformation is a, is a horizontal exercise. It affects uh, different services, and there's a need for, for leadership in order to drive that transformation through, uh, through local government in particular. And then really map and prioritize the service to be digitalized at local level. So the message is really not that uh, perhaps you have a low level of digitalization in a particular area that you should, uh, you should speed up there, but it's really identify those services where, uh, which should be pr uh, served as a priority at the local level. For example, smaller towns may not need a sophisticated uh, parking monitoring system or a mobility solution, um, but they may uh, want to invest in, in, in solutions that, that drive citizen participation and, and engagement. And then really um, engage in collaborations uh, and peer learning to, uh, to, 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 to find out more about best practices and also to essentially develop the skills. I think the skills are really one of the key uh, challenges that we face uh, in Europe uh, that allows uh, public, public institutions to, to adopt those, those solutions. So those were the key messages. I would really invite you to, to take a look at uh, the policy brief. Uh, there are copies outside, and of course, uh, for the audience at home, it's also um, available online. Um, I've given you a bit of an overview of some of the main messages, but of course, uh, the interesting bits are sometimes in the details. So please take a look at uh, the policy brief, and we look forward to, to discussing uh, the various topics and the questions that were raised uh, during this first panel, and then also in the, in the policy labs uh, later on this morning. Thank you. Great. Laurent, thank you very much. So this is a fascinating piece of research that you've introduced, Laurent, where you talked about, um, in terms of usage, the increasing digitization of services. But you mentioned that in the mapping of this process of change, there's a marked divide between uh, what is happening uh, for cities and national level versus what's happening at the area of smaller towns and the regional level. And then this marked divide seems to have been uh, carried through in some of the other areas because when you talked about the challenges, you talked about funding and skills as being challenges for everyone, but you talked particularly about the smaller cities and towns lacking the capacity for integrated strategies or adopting a leadership position. You talked about the larger cities facing a new threshold of legal concerns and other kinds of regulatory dimensions. You talked a lot about partnership and collaboration being a key threshold for the smaller municipalities and smaller towns 
Um, you talked about the growing impact and said that there was a big uptake in services uh, that had been digitalized and also that these services were, uh, in a sense, improving. But again, there was a strong territorial difference in terms of where that's happening. And then you gave us a very helpful matrix of policy imperatives at the EU level, the national level, uh, the medium and large cities, and also uh, the, the towns and the smaller localities. I won't go through all of those because they were very well summarized. So very, very helpful, Laurent. We're very grateful uh, for you putting this uh, to us. Um, let's, if we may, have a very quick look at how you, our word map is developing from the Slido uh, uh, comments. So we asked you to name the three areas where digital transition will have the biggest effect, in your opinion, in the coming years. The size of the words indicates the number of you who have either used that word or endorsed the use of that word by somebody else. So public services, transport, education, administration appear very strongly. Um, round the outside, we can see a few things like relations, entertainment, culture, planning, industry. Uh, please keep voting with this. We'll be looking at it again uh, during the course of the morning and looking at it again at the end. So very interesting. A lot, of, uh, a lot of focus in the room on the public services, the education, transport, social development issues. Uh, please keep voting and please keep uh, proposing words. We'd be delighted to hear those. Now, let's uh, have a panel discussion and get into some of the nuances and bring in people who've got different perspectives uh, on this topic. I'd like to bring Paul Timmers back onto the stage. P Paul, please come and join us because uh, people would like to ask you questions. Let's remember both for people uh, uh, watching the stream and people here in the room, you can ask questions through Slido as well. We will also use the old technology of hands up. Let's bring to the stage, if we may, uh, Anna Piripal, who's the Managing Director for Enterprise Estonia. Anna, welcome to you. Uh, Jonas Onland, the Program Manager for Digital Transition and the Urban Agenda at the city of Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And then Martin Brinskov, who's the Chair of the Open and Agile Smart Cities Program at Aarhus University in Denmark. Please welcome the panel. Panelists, thank you for joining us. We know that you've got uh, a wide range of expertise to bring to this and from different territorial levels, which I think is going to be very interesting. I'm going to ask uh, each of our panelists to take about four minutes to offer their reflections on the conversation so far, picking up the key themes from their perspective and bringing to light um, the views that they have, the evidence that they're involved with about this key question of um, uh, European... Uh, uh, futures, digitalization, the spatial dimension, the territorial dimension, and all of that. And Anna, we'd be really happy if you spoke to us first. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so in the Eastern showroom uh, that I'm managing, this year, thanks to the President's event, we had at least 50% more visitors and high-level decision makers from the European Union, which is great news. And just uh, three years from now, people are really pessimistic about whether this digital transition will work in their country after we shared the e-Estonia story with them. Um, but even this year, we have German delegations, we have Belgian delegations, we have uh, Netherlands delegations, and they are all kind of want to practically dive in and engage with Estonian experts. And why these people come uh, to the showroom? So. The basic facts, the number one rankings, the Global Cybersecurity Index, the number one Entrepreneurship Index, number one in European Union uh, Commission in Digital Economy and Society in Public Services. So this is what brings people to learn from Estonian experience. And while we have a discussion and debate on whether we should do it and what are the risks, there are definitely many, many risks. If we look at the facts, what Estonia has experienced so far, we have e-identity that covers 95% uh, of people. We know the privacy is empowered by identification of people. We are saving 2% of GDP from digital uh, signature, which is legal, by the way, in Europe. But we use digital signature. We're given more of them than the whole European Union combined. And it's funny that 2% of GDP we're saving and 1% is a national from the GDP is usually what we spend for the development in the, in the e-governance field and innovation. 
uh, when looking at the data exchange that, as mentioned, we implemented in 2001 and has, has been using uh, with no stop uh, till today, it's around 800 uh, years of time annually that we are saving, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the working hours of real people, not considering the data to data, machine to machine data exchange. So, and 99% of state services, therefore, because of identification and data exchange, are enabled, and people can use them no matter of their location. Whether you live in a small town, you can get still the healthcare service that you need, or you can get the public service that you need. In some services, you don't even need to have any ICT skills, like in case of the digital prescription that is working worldwide uh, in Estonia today, and actually will be working in Finland because the data exchange will be organized with it as well. So in my perspective, digital technology can erase the real boundaries of the countries. It will do it. Companies and people will choose which residents, uh, which services to subscribe to. Like the best example for me, the e-resident, the fresh e-resident, uh, the former director of DG Connect. Mm. So the environment that European Union could build with technology to simplify this all this administration mm. will not uh, necessarily reduce the workspaces. It will create a whole big market and a community of new companies, companies who can come and work in the European Union, who can contribute to the economy, SMEs and people who will be empowered to become business people because doing business would be so simple. So mm. e-residency is a program, for example, for this. And its economic impact is estimated by 2025 by almost 1.8 um, billion euros to our economy coming from abroad. So we need to do this change. <laughs> That's our key message. Please, uh, since there are many researchers here, dive into what Estonian has experienced so far when you're speaking about the societal change or the economical impact or the impact on businesses and doing business, and uh, take these lessons to European Union level policy. Thank you. Great. Anna, thank you very much indeed. So um, to summarize very quickly, you talked about a transformation in public services. But I think you also talked about a change in the business climate and environment, and particularly in the entrepreneurship model that this enables. You were talking, I think, on some level about uh, fostering a digital competitive advantage. And you're also, in a way, talking about the fruits of adopting a digital brand. We'll come back to all of that in the conversation. Let's go to Jonas now, if we may. Jonas, the floor is yours for four minutes to give us your reflections. All right, thank you. Um, first of all, I'm really honored to be here, uh, and uh, uh, Estonia is, a, is a, for us, we're really jealous, basically. Uh, the things that, that already uh, you've accom that are accomplished here is very uh, um, uh, good for us to, to learn and to, to work on that. Me, uh, as a program manager, I'm working on the digital transition within uh, Eindhoven, in the city of Eindhoven, but also on a national level, uh, and of course uh, uh, in Europe with the urban agenda and the partnership of the digital transition where we work together with uh, 10 countries uh, and cities combined, the uh, European Commission, to work on, on this uh, uh, transformation um, uh, that we're in. Uh, and it's going, it, it is happening. Um, and the big question on that is, is implementation. Um, um, a lot of the technology is already there, so the question is how to scale up, how to learn, uh, how to make, uh, help cities uh, throughout Europe uh, um, to not to reinvent the wheel, yeah. but to 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 learn to take the lessons learned and to implement it on a local level. Um, uh, with the partnership, we're working on uh, um, on a, a few goals, and there are two uh, main challenges which are already uh, presented this morning as well. Um, 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 the 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 free flow of data. So how how do we go? How do we generate the the, the value which is generated? Um, um, through data um, worldwide, um, as our Elderman says, uh, we're becoming a cash dispenser of, of Silicon Valley. So mm -hmm. how does the value uh, which is generated come back to our citizens? Um, mm -hmm. The second big challenge is how to, to safeguard uh, uh, the public uh, interest. So basically, uh, uh, the examples of, of uh, the questionnaire of MIT who's asking if you're in your self-driving car and it's deciding for you whether you drive into a, a woman with a baby or into a wall. It's, yeah. a, it's a big ethical question. The algorithm is, is deciding. So 
we need transparency on those ethical questions as well. Mm. Um, um, from that perspective, there's one big challenge uh, and question uh, um, which we also can learn from Silicon Valley, basically, is um, uh, what's in it for me? Why, why, are, why is it working in, in, in the US? It's because they experience and look at, look at the end user, look at what's the result for them. That's why people start using apps mm. and, and everything. So um, we, uh, with the partnership, we were looking at, an, at an, uh, a quote and a purpose where we we're going for. And um, with the partnership, we're trying to um, um, move, move forward towards meaningful technology that en enhances the quality of life of every citizen it touches. It's yeah. a nice objective, of course, it, but meaningful technology, not like uh, to have 20 apps every day, yeah. uh, uh, which sends you push messages, but much more focused on human-centered services. So yeah. the e-government uh, uh, focus and also the ownership of data uh, um, is, is one real important key message. Not to reinvent it, like stated, but more how to implement that as a country and as a city. Because as a city of Eindhoven, we're just too small to do that. We need mm. the national government, we need other cities mm. to learn from those experiences. That's, that's one of the m main actions. Second part is how are we going to work on new technologies? So uh, there are a lot of emerging technologies or digital technologies coming up, like, uh, of course, 5G, which is, which is uh, starting at the Olympics uh, uh, next year, but also virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, um, and there are a lot of challenges, not only the legal framework, but also the principle and ethical framework uh, where we need to, need to focus on. There's a lot of research which is there, but how can we make a toolbox for cities if you want to start in your city mm. uh, implementing 5G? What do you need to take in account from a procurement perspective, principal perspective, but also legal perspective? Mm. Uh, third part is, is, is the, uh, um, uh, the uh, like already, the haves and the, and the, the not haves. So uh, um, how can we uh, uh, maintain uh, digital inclusion so that everybody can use uh, the technology? And um, then again, one of the quotes from Estonia as well, which I heard, uh, uh, um, uh, everybody can be di digital. It's, it's not, it, it, it's, it's the only thing is you need good design so that end users can really uh, use it very s on a very simple way that's, um, that's easy to use. And it's very interesting to have those three actions, but the real concern is how do we work together? How do you innovate? So, um, and that's one of the things I didn't hear this morning mm. that, that clear. Um, and you need not only the different layers of, of local government and European level, but you also, within your e innovation ecosystem, need to work together with the education system, mm. with citizens, um, with businesses and the local government. And that's, that's a big, big challenge. Uh, um, uh, we have a lot of experience in that, but it's, it's challenging. So the pace of change never will be this slow again. So uh, uh, <laughs> it's an exciting time. <laughs> Jonas, it is indeed an exciting time. Thank you very much for that. You, you've really raised a very fundamental issue about ethical frameworks, public goods, citizen value, and how all of that is achieved and secured. And uh, you've talked particularly about the frameworks for that, the regulatory frameworks, but also how you bring that to a conversation about digital inclusion and new technologies. Very quickly, uh, another old-style vote. How many people in the room are confident that the ethical framework behind the, all of this digitalization is sound? If you think the ethical framework is sound, please raise your hand. <laughs> if you think it might not be sound, raise your hand. Okay, so this concern is shared by lots of people in the room uh, as well. Um, Martin, can we have, please, your reflections? Um, what have you made of this so far? Tell us your view. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so yes, I'm an academic. I'm, I'm quite surprised to see that, that a, a third of the audience are academics or researchers. Ah, but this is Espon. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, but actually, I'm not here in that respect. I'm here because I'm chair of a global network of cities called mm. Open Agile Smart Cities, mm. trying actually to tackle this um, across you know, the big ones and the small ones. So two reflections, and, and thank you very much, Paul and Laurent, for, for setting the stage. Um, I think what, what we're missing at the moment is, is some mechanisms that can work in both the big contexts. I, I would consider Eindhoven an advanced example, and obviously also to me, coming from Denmark, uh, Estonia is an inspire, inspiring example. So the question is, which 
mechanisms, which standards might work for everyone, because mm. that is actually one of the key missing things. Mm. Now, we could ask Silicon Valley to invent some, and I'm <clears throat> sure they are very happy to do so. Yeah. But so your reflection on would that work? Well, mm. I think from a European perspective, probably not. Mm. The question is then who mm. will come up with an alternative, and in fact, local governments, cities and communities are a very relevant place to look, because this is where you find out whether you want sensors in your bed yeah. or whether the pothole uh, registration works. Mm. But how many cities have a department for developing global standards? Mm. I know of two. <laughs> um, so how do we link these efforts with actually the, um, uh, the insight and, and th the needs of, of local uh, governments and communities? I think that's, that's a missing piece, but I also think there are some elements that are quite uh, encouraging. Um, so from the European Commission side, we have some uh, frameworks. The uh, European Innovation Partnership and Smart Cities Communities have done a lot of work, and also under the uh, leadership of, of Paul, in putting both quite developed cities and communities together with followers. So I think this is a very, very sound principle that we learn together. Um, another thing is that, uh, you know, combining uh, the, the excellence, the, the front runners, with the capacity building. So this is very much mm -hmm. about cohesion, mm -hmm. the, the conversation we're having in this room today. Mm -hmm. but, but there's another conversation about, you know, the, f the avant-garde, the what's the next, what's the VR, what's, what's you know, all the artificial mm. intelligence and, and blockchain. Mm. So we need to, to somehow find fora where this can happen. And, I, and I'm actually, I was one of the ones registering is very optimistic because yeah. I, I see that is happening. I, I think the, the foundations in Europe are there. And I think Europe and European cities and communities have actually the opportunity to lead the way through the ethical dilemmas, mm. um, through the entrepreneurship uh, from the companies. So what we need to establish mm. from the cities and communities and the uh, regional and national governments is a common voice actually for these mechanisms, whether they're technical yeah. or they're um, I would even say ethical, but certainly uh, the, the jurisdictions, the legal frameworks. We need somehow to find a coherent voice. Mm. So uh, obviously from the network that I'm representing, this, mm. is, uh, this is happening now, I would say very much under European leadership, but globally with 114 uh, cities in 23 countries. So I'd, mm. I'd invite uh, everyone to, to, to check out that. Um, but I, I would say, actually, with, with the representatives in the room and also the voices we have here, um, I think we're, we're pretty much on the way to finding an alternative to just leaving it to uh, the big fives, as it were. Hmm. Martin, thank you very much indeed. I mean, this is a really profound part of the conversation, actually, which is Europe's role in this from a global perspective. And you've said, firstly, you're very optimistic. Secondly, there's a leadership role to be played. And thirdly, that Europe is very well positioned to lead not just on these ethical issues that digitalization raises, but also these issues of digital inclusion. And uh, you talked a lot about the partnership approach, the leaders working with the whole field, the role of networks and partnerships in making that happen. Fascinating stuff. We're going to come back to all of this. We've got about 27 minutes for a conversation now. And I have a lot of questions on my list. But I'm more interested in your, your questions than mine. So if you can put your questions into Slido, or in about five minutes when I ask you, raise your hands, that will be great. Uh, I can see some questions are already there. And you're already favoriting and, uh, and uh, supporting or liking particular questions. So that's good. But let me ask just a couple of questions first. And then we'll, we'll go immediately to the questions on the screen after that. So, um, Paul, I really want to ask you to pick up this kind of core challenge and just give us your view in simple language. Is digitalization going to uh, concentrate and crystallize the existing spatial development pattern in Europe, or is it really going to disrupt it and change it? Well, uh, I'm certainly not an expert in that, so my kind of um, opinion, looking at it a little bit from a helicopter view, is that 
uh, there are some very big trends and digital is kind of only part of that, you know, the, the, the trends of migration, the trends of uh, people moving into uh, cities, the trends of the kind of activity and jobs that they are looking for, and digital can be used in a very fruitful way, I think, to then maintain cohesion, but you will have to work actively on it, and that means actively uh, using digital for information provision, for what I've said before, make sure that uh, whatever you know about your territory, region, uh, urban or rural area gets uh, uh, captured into data and then make that available. And this, I think, comes back a lot also to, to what Martin says about uh, standards and, for example, the availability of data to build these new services. And then, in a certain sense, you know, digital is a tool to maintain, increase, and perhaps also to decrease uh, cohesion. So there's not, for me, a simple, definite answer to that. There are very powerful forces here at work, and digital we can use to the best that we uh, think is, uh, is is feasible there, but we need to discuss what is the best. Not everybody agrees to that, and certainly, what would be very risky is that we just let it happen, mm. because then you know you are out of control and you will feel uh, that you have lost autonomy. Great, thank you very much. Just a message to our team at the back: if we can uh, list the questions by the most favourited, that would be very helpful. Look, thank you, brilliant. We'll come back to these questions in a couple of minutes because I want to put to Martin the same question I just put to Paul. How far is digitalization going to change the spatial patterns in Europe overall and how much will it concentrate what's already there, in your view? Well, I completely agree with Paul. I think it's going to change things fundamentally, but we should not let that just happen. I mean, we're seeing, I think, worrying signs of fragmentation. I will mention no uh, nations here today. But um, I think that that's a global trend, that mm. digitalization can actually really fracture uh, also uh, communities. So we have a lot of questions coming up now already about inclusion and, sure. and different age groups. Mm. So I think that, that would probably be my biggest worry, that mm. we just think that digitalization is something positive. Mm. I think actually digitalization is a challenge. I mean, on the order of you know uh, mm. rising water levels and stuff like that. So mm. I, the, the impact is profound. So I think mm. we have to, to, to really see it as a challenge rather than just you know, as a, as a God-given opportunity to, to you know, optimize. Yeah. While we're talking about this, why don't you take question two, Martin? How is artificial intelligence going to change territorial patterns in Europe? Any reflections on that? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, it really depends. It depends whether it is, um, I would say, well understood what it could do. Because I think the, the main action we can do as societies is to ensure that our institutions and our communities actually can uh, work with, say, artificial intelligence. So we need to understand in, in public government, in public services, mm. how can that be both leveraged for mm. good mm. and how can that be, let's say, cushioned where it's, it's going to have an impact. For instance, it can reveal stuff that we don't want revealed. Mm. I mean, re housing prices, mm. uh, lots of uh, actually very sensitive stuff when you just throw the algorithms at the world. Sure. So I think it all comes down actually and in this context, this is very relevant, to capacity building. We need to build capacity to brace for the future. Great. Thank you very much. Jonas, you raised these big moral and ethical dilemmas. And before we go all the way into the questions on the screen, can you just tell us about how you think um, digital transition can help with some of these really big issues? Aging, shrinking populations, migration, climate change, the big social and environmental pressures Europe faces. Is the digital transition part of how we address those? Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of, uh, I think in the, in the new technologies and, and the digital transitions, there are a lot of possibilities to, uh, to work on these challenges. The thing is, they're huge. Uh, uh, and, 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 and you have to make it small again. So the way how we work together with people using technology yeah. uh, can start, um, um, like stated this morning, uh, uh, participation is the, is the basis for, for trust and, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, and growth, basically. Yeah. So, so you, you need to use these technologies uh, to show the, the results that it's yeah. working and make it grow from there. Because if mm. you, if the, if you big, make the challenges too big, mm. um, it's, not gonna, it's gonna, not gonna work. The biggest challenge in Holland on e-health, for example, mm. is 
uh, the technology is there. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you see, them, they were already already there three years ago. The yeah. question is how to accelerate and how do the end users start using yeah. uh, these technologies? And and eventually the results yeah. will be that you cope with these with these big challenges. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, I think um, it's um, on IoT censoring yeah. within your uh, uh, city on on on, on climate uh, changes, yeah. uh, uh, um, self-driving cars, electric yeah. cars um, will will solve a lot of of these issues. Question is how to implement these technologies within your city, and yeah. that's the biggest challenge in my opinion. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. And Anna, again, before we come to a ready, rather juicy question that's there for you, just tell us a little bit more about how Estonia has tackled this issue of uh, social cohesion and equality. If I may say, you know, some of the, uh, uh, the obvious benefits for Estonia have been around competitiveness, enterprise, business brand, efficiency. What about the inclusion and social cohesion part of the story? Well, a little bit reflecting on some of the questions also. Yeah. Mm, let's take the aging population, the mm. elderly, like as a target group, which creates a lot of fears, like how can they cope in this future uh, economy? Um, for example, when the government is using the online systems, then for an old lady to come to one governmental office and get all of the services that they need just there with no paperwork is much easier than having to, in a typical bureaucratical model, to go into different. Or it's much easier for me to take my grandmother and her ID card and show her the bank account mm. using the online bank when we're sitting on the couch. Mm. Um, there have been many programs uh, from 2002 when a specialized, kind of very simple ICT course that were financed by telcos and um, banks that were educating around 20% of uh, the older population on how to use computers, how to use public services, how to read mail, and we started pretty early with this. Yeah. So of course you have to increase the skills of people, but you also can design the services in a way that they don't need you to be an IT genius. Yeah. Uh, digital prescription doesn't require any IT skills. It's enough if you phone the doctor, wherever you are, whatever the doctor is, mm. and he can create a digital prescription that you can pick up from the closest pharmacy. So all the skills you need is calling and giving your ID document. Mm. That's the best example of how digital services could work. But the ideal case that Estonia is working on now is a zero bureaucracy. Mm. You know, you don't need to ask for the service because the government's uh, putting the data together like, for example, having a baby will just exchange the data that they have about you and just pay you the mother benefits without any kind of initiation from your side. The same with pension increase, the same with kind of medication. This can be automatized and brought to the level from administrational point of view when there is no need for many people to even have IT yeah. skills or knowledge yeah. because things will just happen for them. Great. And can we go back to the screen with the prioritized questions on, please? And Anna, while you've got the microphone, can you pick up question two now? Then I'm going to ask Paul to pick up question one. Question two asked about how did you succeed in overlapping, I guess this means overcoming, mm -hmm. the fears for the transition to digital governance from the old model of governance. This required people to change their attitude. How did you provoke and support mm -hmm. that change? Yeah, you see, uh, Estonia development path in the 90s when we uh, re-established independence did not include having a lot of resources or a lot of workforce. So we did not actually consider building a typical model in the very beginning. We could not afford having government offices around the country. You can consider Estonia as a kind of a small city <laughs> in a way, but with a very different density of population. So all of these kind of challenges realized in our case and this led to kind of a more common understanding and the digital leadership and alignment throughout different levels of government. Um, at the same time, fear comes from the lack of experience. You know, I can tell you three days about how great iPhone is if you have never used a smartphone. Mm you will not understand it. So yeah. positive practice is the basis for building the trust. Yeah. Once you have some digital service, people will use it. They will gain more trust into the yeah. government capability, into the services, into yeah. the technology. And this trust will gradually grow, but it has grown. 
Yeah. So did you provide incentives or public education or uh, demonstration projects to really make people adopt the new uh, technology? Sure, of course. There are in, in many shopping malls, there are different campaigns on how to use the uh, services. Yeah. A lot of campaigns about what kind of e-services you can use so yeah. you don't have to go to any government office. Yeah. Um, tax, let's say, let's take the e-tax, the basic yeah. example yeah. from 2000 already. When you're doing the tax declaration, you don't have to put the data together. It's all there. You just log in. You see in three minutes all the calculation. What's the money the government will refund you? And your motivation to do it is actually to spend three minutes of your life, get the money back from the government, and not have to go anywhere at all. So Great. kind of built-in service design motivators yeah. and legal ones as well, like making services cheaper when they're used online. Great. I think a lot of people will want to know more about that. Jonas, before we come to you, I want to just ask Paul for a minute to comment on the question that's been deleted, which was the one <laughs> about um, using ICTs to tackle this digital divide, particularly with uh, elderly citizens, it mentioned, and other people who are otherwise marginalised. Any particular tips? Yeah, and then, Martin, I want you to come to the next question. It also said that uh, should we maintain parallel systems? Yeah. And I think, actually, conceptually, uh, there is, uh, that's wrong here. Uh, because there's a lot of uh, uh, IT which is already there today that can be used and you don't really know that it is IT. So someone who is in the care uh, position or a, a family member or the elderly people themselves are using it perhaps without knowing them. So in, in Eindhoven there is a company developing smart textiles that can monitor the condition of your elderly parent. Uh, there is already available some kind of uh, display that is put on a table where elderly people can play cars and then a camera is moving, is following their movements and so you can detect something from it that actually informs the care workers is this elderly person participating or not, there are smart toothbrushes, those kind of things. So it's not only about going online or not and I think it's actually really the wrong perception if we think about maintaining parallel systems. No, it's going to be combined systems. It can go wrong, of course, because uh, the bad example is, of course, the remote control of the television mm -hmm. that my uh, elderly parents can't, can't use because it's too complex. Wrong IT, wrongly mm -hmm. designed. Mm -hmm. So fixing it means certainly uh, something else that has been mentioned here. You need to work together very closely between the people who are the users and the designers and the ones that will bring it in the market. And I'm fairly optimistic about that because that's where you see precisely now a lot of very interesting innovation happening. Great, thank you very much. Jonas, you wanted to make a comment? Yeah, the, and maybe to add uh, on the earlier question, I think um, what we learn from the approach which was done here, uh, um, a lot of comments that I get in, in the Netherlands is that but we have legacy. We're not having a, a green field and uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're not starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying internally, why not? Let's, mm -hmm. let's, uh, we don't need a change strategy, but we need a disruption strategy. So let's, mm -hmm. let's act like there's nothing and start from mm -hmm. scratch. Mm. and use then the infrastructure that we need, but start with the end mm. use and start building from there. Uh, and, and, and that helps us in, 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 um, in working on that, um, maybe to add. Exactly. Great, thank you very much. Martin, pick up the next question if you would. So I'm just going to read it. How far do you think that digital transition is being used by the economic powers to control citizens? and reduce self-organization possibilities of the people. So this is a skeptical question, yeah? It is. Yeah. I, I, think, um, I think there's very good reason for being skeptical, actually, mm. because, yes, the economic powers are using it to the fullest. Why not? I mean, what, what's new? I, I think we need to treat the digital environment just as we are treating the mm. physical environment. Mm. We need good environmental policies. Mm. So again, coming back, it's not just something that is going to help mm. us. It's actually something that we need to manage, that we need to have good principles for. Mm. Now, the sad thing is we don't have the principles yet. Mm. We don't have the good policies. They are still being uh, you know, uh, f um, found out, and, and it, they are being developed. So I think um, the, 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 the short answer is yes. Mm. If we don't do something, if we don't, let's say, put um, uh, targets on good mm. digital environment out mm. there. Mm. When we do procurement, this mm. is a very, very strong instrument. When we do local, like the, the zoning laws, mm. the digital zoning laws, it's a wild west. You can, put, you can plow through, uh, you know, uh, wonderful commons, mm. uh, as it were. We, we're mm. back in, you know, 115 years when the men who made America and Europe were just, you know, putting railroads and steel factories, mm. you know, without asking. 
Mm. This is the state we have at the moment in the digital. So we have to think of it mm. like we think about good environment. Open data, yes, that's like clean water mm. on right terms with the right licenses. Mm. But we don't have them yet. Yeah. So therefore, we have to do exactly what, what you say and what is happening in Eindhoven and many other places. Engage in these transition, whether it's projects. There are plenty of projects where you can go mm. together with colleagues Mm. also from other cities and other communities to learn. Yep. And I think this is really, mm. the, you know, the instruments that can take us there are really the crucial step to close this gap. Great. Thank you very much. Now, we will come back to these questions in a minute. Can we have another look at our word map, please, from question, uh, our second question this morning? Thank you very much. So, uh, hasn't changed that much, but healthcare and jobs seem to be uh, coming up a little bit. Thank you very much. Keep voting. Now, old technology. Who wants to just ask a question of one of our panelists? <laughs> Anybody like to do that? Raise your hand. <laughs> shout a question out. We'll see if they want to answer it. Anybody here waiting to do that? No? All digital natives now, it <laughs> seems, right? So all wanting to use the digital. Can we go back to our list of our wall of questions then from Slido? Uh, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. So, um, Martin, you've given us a comment about that. Anybody want to uh, say something different to what Martin said about, you know, the use of uh, this digital thing to control, you know, the, the fake news, the uh, using digitization deliberately to disrupt, confuse, manipulate people. Anyone co else concerned about that on the panel? No. Paul? Perhaps a few words about that. I mean, that's, that, that's nowadays kind of part of the broad terrain of uh, cyber security and what's happening in terms of uh, hacking or in terms of uh, false information or all of that. And I think we need to take it very seriously because we are not talking about uh, just digital. We are talking about uh, democracy. We are talking mm -hmm. about autonomy. We are talking about uh, security. And there are real uh, threats out there. Uh, it's very good that people are becoming aware of that and starting to spot that uh, these kind of actions are happening. Uh, with malicious intent, or perhaps sometimes also involuntarily. You have got these this kind of echo chambers. People are just repeating what they are saying to each other. So you need to break that uh, open. Uh, also, actually, because you want to keep control. So uh, you want to have a debate about what is happening with your data, and what is right and what is wrong, and how you look at uh, people that are differently. So talk about migrants, for example. Eh? You know, you need to create nearness, cohesion. That means you cannot afford that you have all these uh, islands. Very challenging, super responsible to do that. If we don't do it, uh, we are going to be uh, lost. Can we do it? Yeah, absolutely. There are many of these. Actually, I'm quite optimistic about the bottom-up initiatives that are uh, happening. So peculiar mm. enough, while there are perhaps these big kind of entities that are using our information and uh, you feel that you are perhaps powerless, at the same time you see sharing economy coming up, you see crowdfunding, crowdsourcing coming mm. up, you see a lot of social media discussion coming up. Mm. So that's perhaps also the positive side to it. Very good. Anna? Yeah, I totally agree that this is uh, there are big, big risks in this area on um, the fake news and mm. uh, like economic powers. Uh, but it doesn't mean we don't have to use the digital technologies and the modern technologies in sure. order to identify them and prevent them, like well, blockchain that provides the accountability and transparency that we yeah. use, that European Union now uses as well, uh, so we can, with no people, um, so distantly monitor whether the integrity of, their, of yeah. the rules that we have established, or using artificial intelligence maybe to help us plan the future financial crisis if this was overlooked by actually so many great minds because mm. it's just technically not possible to take into account so much information. So uh, mm. it's definitely going to help us, but uh, as any technology, as any tool can be used for good and for bad, we, I agree on the ethical side of it. Yeah, great. Needs Thank you. Done. Now, panelists, what I want you to do is that I want uh, you, Jonas, to take the bottom question here, if you don't mind. Yep. Can inhabitants still use other ways of reaching public authorities in Eindhoven? Is there a risk of exclusion? And then I want, uh, Anna, you to focus on the rural uh, and urban areas. Can we keep the, 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 the screen still for a moment? <laughs> and then, uh, Martin, I want you to focus on this question about the likely impact of digitalization on urban and spatial development and land uses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jonas, off you go. Yeah, um, um, I think you always need to have the possibility to, uh, uh, um, um, to make it possible for citizens to come mm. and, 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 and use it. Um, but uh, the way we do it now is that we, uh, if someone comes in, um, we help them and we do it for them. Mm. 
And uh, we use the metaphor, um, uh, we don't want to uh, give people a fish, but we want to to learn how to fish. Yeah. So um, um, instead of, uh, so, so that they come there, uh, have a good cup of coffee, have a good conversation, have a g great experience and learn, uh, learn them to uh, uh, use the services that we want. Um, so yes, we, it needs to be there, it needs mm. to be possible, mm. uh, but as an as a, uh, offline trigger to help people uh, to become digital uh, mm. themselves. Great, thank you very much. Anna, what about the rural and the marginal areas in Estonia? Do they participate to the same degree as the people living in Tallinn and the other cities? Well, since they can use the basic infrastructure, the National for Data Exchange, yeah. uh, the, state, uh, the ID, which is yeah. also nationwide, these are two tools they don't have to invest to. They yeah. can focus, they can simplify their administration, if you mean of the local government level, yeah. or some smaller regions, so they have more time to develop the services and think about that. Yeah. And uh, since um, with the EID, from the banking, taxation, public services of different types are brought online, the issue comes down to whether you have an internet connection there mm. that is available, that is uh, for a normal price. I've seen kind of a question about that. Um, I don't know how to get to the level, but in Estonia, internet access is rather uh, affordable. Mm. I would say 3G you can get yeah. for starting from 6 euros uh, yeah. in your mobile where you can't have broadband. We're still struggling with yeah. those marginal rural areas to provide them the 100 megabit that we should. <laughs> so it's going to be one kilometer. We still have to do around So uh, you've got 10, the final kilometer to go. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> it's yeah. about the accessibility of the internet uh, yeah. in whatever form it may be. It might be actually, we don't always need the, the broadband in this yeah. regard. Yeah. We might just go with a 5G very well, yeah. because mobile devices, these are devices people are commonly using. Yes. Okay, great. So, Martin, this question, and the last question, Paul, on mobility patterns, if you can, please, and then we're going to close the session. So I'm going to set you up, Paul, here, because <clears throat> I, I think the, the fundamental answer is yes. So uh, the fact that we can now track and monitor everything that's going on, including the almost real-time valuation of every square meter in the city, is going to uh, make urban planning and, and planning in general much more transparent. Now, fundamentally, there are two perspectives on planning. One is economic, and one is well, the quality of life, you could yeah. say. Yeah. And fr fr much urban planning is happening now from a purely economic uh, uh, perspective right now. Mm -hmm. So I think two things are fundamentally going to change. It will become transparent how yeah. these two converge. So it will be much more uh, visible to the citizens yeah. who look at you know, the plans that yeah. the city is making. What is the impact? So I think that is fundamentally going to challenge the role of the planners because yeah. it'll be, uh, as, as you mentioned also, Paul, much more, yeah. I would say, uh, symmetric. So the sharing, the, the, the participation yeah. will be uh, much higher. Yeah. Now, the other thing is that uh, when the city becomes essentially like, do you know the, the computer game called SimCity, where you can play yeah. around the yeah. city? As, as this situation approaches now, and you can in real time play around with things, um, you also get the real... Uh, problems of optimizing the city, mm. uh, including that what you thought was a good idea turns out not to be a good idea. Mm. Mm. Um, so I think we will see in, in the first mo move, oh wow, we can optimize all kinds of things, but it very very quickly we will realize, oh damn, it was, it was the, the old principles actually of identity that won. Yeah. So I think we will see it first, first a shift towards optimizing, optimizing, and then actually falling back on very old principles of uh, urban and uh, spatial planning. But we just don't have the, let's say, the, the instruments yet for the digital side of that. Uh, but I think they will have to emerge yeah. driven, actually, by the local level, and then uh, hopefully uh, coming together on, on good, uh, to, for, for good principles, uh, how these um, very, very slow uh, timelines meet the very fast uh, real-time ones. Thank you, Martin. Quick comment, Anna? Yeah, just a very quick one. Um, we're speaking about only how the government does things themselves yeah. and think of what is right for the town and the planning, yeah. but uh, what about people? Yeah. The digital technology allows actually to ask the users, the yep. people who live in these local areas, it's part of the co-creation mechanism. We should put this definitely in because if we think something is right, it doesn't mean that the end user will actually enjoy the bus stop there. Oh. So not only the big data, but engaging real people and the real 
participants of this environment would be critical. Yeah. Thank you very much. Paul, the last comment about the mobility question. Yeah, about the mobility. So here are a number of points I mentioned. Mobility, smart manufacturing, smart working. Uh, there is an important European initiative, digitizing uh, industry, to look at so that traditional industries are also going to go more digital. There is also a big debate happening about uh, sourcing back manufacturing into Europe. Uh, what is common in that is that you get more high ad added value. So it's not a traditional manufacturing anymore. You need to think about uh, how people will work differently, add value differently, and there are new opportunities uh, there for sure. But that's like a real industrial strategy that you can develop at all levels, whether this is city, uh, rural, uh, whether it's uh, the national and also the European level. Uh, and I think in that we also need to look um, kind of outside. Uh, so it's not about Europe only, it's also about how we work together in international supply chains, to use the somewhat horrible world, mm -hmm. word, how we work together with Africa, how we can reduce the pressure of uh, migration, because actually we are also going to use digital there in the context of manufacturing and uh, services provision. So these are difficult uh, policy questions, but uh, they are not diff more difficult for us than they are for anyone else in the world. So I think we've got a good basis in Europe to tackle those. Great. Thank you very much indeed. This has been a fantastic panel, and in a minute I'm going to ask you to thank them. But firstly, I'm just going to do a quick summary and then give you some information. So um, what I take from this conversation is not just this optimism and this enthusiasm for the opportunities that come from this new generation of exponential technologies, and particularly how they interact both with public services with citizen participation, but also with economic processes. But I think I've heard you say very, very clearly that it's an opportunity to put citizens right at the centre of a new way of organising the world and to organise around people. If you like, it's not so much about smart systems, it's about smart citizens and how they get to lead their lives. That was interesting. On the big question about whether these new technologies will alter the spatial development, the territorial pattern of Europe, I don't think we've yet had a conclusive answer, and we should keep this big question open. But I think you all said in one way or another that these technologies have the power to reduce some of the rigidities in spatial patterns. And I'd like to hear more about that from our speakers during the course of the day. Then I think three other things were said very, very clearly. Firstly, this requires proactive policies and proactive leaderships from all levels of government. Nothing good happens in this space accidentally, as it were. It does require a new kind of public governance around the digital space to curate, to create opportunities, to co-create with others. We heard, particularly from Martin, but everybody emphasized this, the importance of partnerships as ways of taking forward opportunities, organizing around citizen groups, thinking about um, their needs, public, private, local, regional, urban, national, urban, rural, uh, and if, as it were, the, uh, the, the whole idea of cascading capability or bringing together capability from different places. And then lastly, I think we heard something very important about Europe's role in the world and uh, the leadership role, perhaps, of Europe on addressing the, the ethical issues that are here, the issues that are to do with public goods and how to secure them through digitalization, and the issues to do with standard setting and standard dissemination. So from my point of view, really interesting conversation. Let's now give a big vote of thanks to our brilliant panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.